record. All right, um, welcome, welcome. Good morning or afternoon or evening, everyone, wherever you are. Um, I am Miriam Bender, Associate Professor in the School of Nursing and the Director for the School Center for Nursing Philosophy. Uh, welcome to this virtual speaker event series in which the center tries to bring the new to nursing in terms of ideas that can help spark novel thinking about our own ideas, practices, and scholarship. So we do try for diversity and perspectives, and I've heard from scholars across multiple disciplines as well as nursing, and uh, which we aim to continue in the future. So if you have a topic of interest, please feel free to reach out and let me know. And thank you for all the um, chats already happening. That's exciting. If I if you can't hear us, um, perhaps your microphone is muted. That was the case with myself earlier. Um, today, we have the great pleasure of learning from a fellow colleague here at UC Irvine, Kyle Stanford, where he is professor in the Department of Logic and Philosophy of Science. He's also the series editor of the Oxford Studies in the Philosophy of Science at the Oxford University Press. He has written about a wide variety of topics in the history and philosophy of science, especially concerning the nature of theoretical scientific knowledge. His 2006 book, Exceeding Our Grasp, Science, History, and the Problem of Unconceived Alternatives, argued that the history of scientific inquiry itself reveals that there are typically well-confirmed theoretical alternatives to even the best scientific theories that simply remain unconceived at the time those theories are accepted, and that this historical record gives us every reason to think that there are probably alternatives to even the most successful contemporary scientific theories that simply remain presently unconceived. His work has appeared in the Journal of Philosophy, Philosophy of Science, and a variety of other venues. In today's talk, he'll talk about, <clears throat> excuse me, changes in the incentive structure of science over the course of its history, which have increasingly favored theoretical conservatism and intolerance of theoretical heterodoxy in his, in his view. And he will propose some potential remedies for the prevalence of these features in contemporary scientific communities. Before I turn it over to you, Kyle, and your majestic beard, I just wanted to let everyone know that the event will be recorded it will be made available to all registrants in an email that'll go out next week. So please be looking for that. Also, there will be plenty of time for uh, questions and discussion after Kyle's talk. You are free to please use the chat box as a you know, Twitter feed for sharing ideas and resources, et cetera. But for uh, questions that you would specifically like Kyle to address, uh, put those in the Q&A box and I will be reading them out. Um, to Kyle for um, his <clears throat> response. Additionally, if you would like to ask the question in person, so to speak, uh, please go ahead and raise your hand using the, um, the, the little raise hand icon in Zoom and uh, I can work to virtually whiz you into the panel if you wish and we can dialogue that way. So having said all that, uh, I would like to go ahead and hand things over to Kyle and have him get started. Thanks Kyle and welcome. Hey, thank you for having me. Um, thanks to everybody who's here for uh, joining us. Uh, and uh, I'm looking forward to it. Um, let me see if I can successfully do this screen sharing business. Okay, so I'm going to assume everybody should be able to see that that title screen now. And uh, I'm sure Miriam will sweep in and stop me if we can't. Um, You're looking good. All right, outstanding. Um, so uh, yeah, so let me say again, thank you uh, to, to Miriam for inviting me to participate in uh, this series. Uh, and uh, I'm very much looking forward to hearing um, thoughts from this audience in particular about um, the, uh, the the incentive shifting incentive stuff I'm going to talk about today. So let's um, uh, let's go ahead and get get to it. Um, okay, so I want to start here though. Um, at least since the pioneering of work of of Thomas Kuhn, who you see up in the right hand corner there, um, philosophers of science famously have been fascinated by scientific revolutions. Uh, that is to say, episodes in which a highly, a, a highly successful and widely accepted theory of what some part of nature was like uh, or is like uh, were ultimately displaced 
by a radically different and even more successful and powerful alternative. Um, the most famous of many, many historical examples would include Lavoisier's chemical revolution in the 18th century, uh, Darwin's complete transformation of biology in the 19th century, and uh, Einstein's uh, replacement of Newton's wildly successful mechanics with his own even more successful relativistic alternative early in the 20th century. Uh, in fact, some of us, uh, as, uh, as Miriam was kindly mentioning, uh, some of us have suggested that that persistent historical pattern gives us good reason to believe that even the most empirically successful and powerful scientific theories of our own day will ultimately be replaced in the future by even more successful alternatives that we have not yet even conceived of or considered. My own version of this case, uh, this case for historical continuity, emphasizes the repeated failure of earlier scientists and scientific communities to even conceive of serious alternatives to theories available at the time that were nonetheless both scientifically serious and reasonably well confirmed by the evidence available at the time, including the very alternatives that would become, that would come to be embraced by later scientific communities, right? The idea is uh, folks at the time of, of accepting Newton's mechanics didn't think it was better than relativistic mechanics. They just hadn't thought of relativistic mechanics yet. Uh, and so there wasn't even a, a comparison going on, right? That made it an unconceived alternative, that made relativity an unconceived alternative theory at the time that Newton's, Newton's theory was being accepted. So this, 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 th this thing I called the problem of unconceived alternatives that arises because the inferential engine of lots and lots of fundamental theoretical science is essentially eliminative in character, proposing and testing candidate hypotheses and then selecting from among them the one best supported by the evidence as the one in which our credence will be invested. So those, that kind of eliminative inference can and does guide us to the truth in a wide range of contexts, right? So uh, when someone is murdered at an English garden party, Sherlock Holmes always brings the culprit to justice. But the reliability of those inferences absolutely requires that particular conditions be satisfied. One such condition is that we have to have all of the most likely alternative possibilities, suspects or theories in view before proceeding to embrace the winner of this kind of eliminative competition as the truth of the matter. After all, Holmes would be a poor detective if he simply ignored most of the likely suspects in the crime. And we're in a similar predicament if our eliminative inferences are ignoring many well-confirmed theoretical possibilities. Or as uh, physicist Pierre Duhem once framed this same worry in, a, in the scientific context, shall we ever dare to assert that no other hypothesis is imaginable? Light may be a swarm of projectiles, or it may be a vibratory motion whose waves are propagated in a medium. Those were the two options being um, compared and hotly contested at the time uh, that uh, Duhem was writing. But he adds this further question, is it forbidden to be anything else at all? Okay. Now, one advantage of this line of argument, um, I think, uh, uh, for, uh, uh, the idea of, of continued scientific revolution um, is that it, it asserts an historical continuity between the theorists rather than the theories of present science. After all, lots of contemporary scientific theories are different from their predecessors in lots of ways that might affect our assessment of their likely truth. Right? Um, even if their predecessors were very successful, they are the, the theories that replace them to tend to be more successful and stuff like that, right? Uh, so the, the theories of the past and the present differ in ways that might, it might make us think uh, that, uh, that no, we figured it out now, we've had, we, we finally got it, 
got it and further further revolutions in science aren't forthcoming. Um, but it seems like we have very little reason to think that today's scientists, today's theorists are more creative than were even the most brilliant scientists of the past, or that they're otherwise in a better position to exhaust the space of theoretical alternatives well confirmed, oops, uh, well confirmed by the evidence available to them. Given that science has been regularly undergoing fundamental transformative revolutions since at least the scientific revolution, it seems like it would take a lot of hubris to suppose that this process is now complete and that sci contemporary scientifics, scientific theories won't also be abandoned in the future in favor of alternatives that are presently unconceived. But some philosophers of science, we're gonna call them scientific realists, okay? Uh, think that, argue that, contemporary scientific theories give us at least roughly accurate descriptions of how things actually stand in various parts of, of nature. So we shouldn't expect, we should expect, you know, incremental improvement and uh, modification and sophistication, but we shouldn't expect those theories, uh, at least the, the most successful ones, to be overturned. We shouldn't expect any more uh, uh, scientific revolutions in, <clears throat> uh, in those fields. And, uh, and so they have pushed back against the claim. So those, that's what the scientific realists believe. And they have pushed back against the claim that contemporary scientists or scientific communities are no better able than their, than their historical predecessors to conceive of the full range of theoretical alternatives well confirmed by the evidence available to them, right? They say, oh, well, not so fast on saying that there, you know, there's uh, uh, much less room to assert some fundamental difference between theorists of the past or, or scientific communities of the past and those of, of the present. They say, well, no, things have changed. And so um, the kinds of characteristics they have in mind that they point to are things like increases in the sheer size and scope of contemporary scientific communities, how many people we now have working on uh, working in science, how interconnected they are, um, uh, improvements in the sophistication of scientific methods, techniques, and instruments, uh, that our scientific communities are now much more diverse in their membership uh, than they have been in the past, and lots of other important differences besides, right? Um, trying to suggest that, you know, maybe this uh, Maybe this problem of unconceived alternatives business was a problem for past science, but it's, but they suggest, the realists suggest um, for these reasons, maybe it's not still a problem for contemporary science. Now, I agree that the differences that they're pointing to here, right, in the size and scope and sophistication and interconnectedness of our scientific communities are real and important. And I think that they make contemporary scientific communities much more effective vehicles than we've ever had before for testing, evaluating, and applying scientific knowledge. Okay? We're better at doing that than we ever have been. Uh, but I also think that the most important, the most historically important transformations of the ways that those communities work have actually made contemporary scientific communities substantially worse than their predecessors at conceiving, exploring, and developing fundamentally novel conceptions of the natural domains they seek to describe. Right? I think that they have given us a more theoretically conservative form of science and scientific inquiry than we've ever had before. Today, I'm gonna to try to explain why I think that. Now the particular transformations, the historical transformations of the scientific enterprise that I have in mind are these, uh, the professionalization of science in the middle decades of the 19th century, uh, the shift to peer reviewed funding of academic science by the state, right? Institutions like the NSF uh, following World War II, the middle of the 20th century, and the on, still ongoing expansion of so-called big science. What I'm gonna suggest 
is that together these historical transformations of the scientific enterprise have made our scientific communities substantially more theoretically conservative than their historical predecessors and substantially challenged, substantially burdened in comparison to past scientific communities uh, in their ability to uh, 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 consider, propose, develop uh, um, fundamentally distinct alternatives to uh, extant uh, theoretical conceptions of nature. Okay, so that's the plan. Uh, and, uh, and we can now start on that plan. I'm gonna start by talking about the, the first of these changes, the, professionally, the professionalization of science. Um, and historians of science broadly agree that, that the professionalization of science in the middle of the 19th century was the most profound transformation in the social organization of, of modern scientific um, inquiry. So this happened in the middle decades of the 19th century in Europe and the United States. Prior to such professionalization, science was primarily an activity of what historian Martin Rudwick has called gentlemen scholars supported by independent wealth or by royal and aristocratic patronage. Okay. As uh, historian Stephen Chapin points out, early modern students of nature conducted their inquiries in a variety of institutional settings and occupied a variety of social roles. Some were remunerated to conduct their inquiries, but not many. The university and professor was engaged to be a custodian of knowledge and to transmit it to the next generation. The physician and surgeon were remunerated to keep people healthy and to treat them when they were ill. The cleric was responsible for being a mouthpiece for God's words, for living a blameless, if not holy life, and for ensuring the moral conduct of his community. All the people occupying these roles might do scientific research as we now put it, but doing it was not their business. The early modern speaker of truth about nature was almost without exception, not a professional, but an amateur. Uh, continuing on this theme, the historians uh, Bowler and Morris uh, note that these, these gentlemen scholars we're talking about, right? These were men who were leading figures in, in their field. These were the dominant scientists at the time, actually virtually all the scientists at the time but who did not gain their income from science and would have been suspicious of anyone who did. How could you trust people to do that if they had a financial motive for finding new, new interesting things? But that situation, right? And that social organization, that way of doing science was profoundly transformed by what Shapin describes as the social and cultural transition from science as a calling to science as a job in the middle decades of the 19th century. Most critically, uh, gentlemen scholars on the left there had been free, largely free to conduct their research in whatever way and on whatever subjects they liked. They therefore had enormous freedom to simply satisfy their own curiosities, to ride idiosyncratic hobby horses, to grind ideological axes and otherwise pursue lines of research that their colleagues might well see as misconceived, unpromising, or uninteresting. And they were free to do all that, only if only because they were not being paid, no one was paying them to conduct that first work in the first place. They could do anything they wanted, right? They could propose anything they wanted. And in fact, the, the real incentives of scientific work in that, um, in that era uh, were to um, find something new. Uh, by contrast, the emerging class of professional scientists depended for their livelihoods on the estimation of the achievements and promise of their scientific research by other members of the community of scientific professionals. So after the middle decades of the 1800s, scientists had to care about what their professional colleagues thought of their work because that was how they made a living. Such a professional community, almost by definition, is far more homogeneous in its thinking and its assumptions and its motives and in the dimensions of its creative freedom that a community made up largely of gentlemen scholars supported by their own wealth, aristocratic, aristocratic patronage and other independent means. In fact, um, th this is actually um, quite important um, and interesting. It turns out restricting part of the process of forming these professional communities of professionalizing science 
was restricting the sorts of research questions that were regarded as appropriate to a scientific discipline, restricting the sorts of activities undertaken in attempts to answer them, and restricting the sorts of answers and theoretical proposals that were regarded as plausible or even genuinely scientific to begin with. These were these restrictions in all, of all these sorts were among the most common ways in which groups of scientific practitioners sought to mark themselves off as professionals and distinguish themselves from those they dismissed as mere amateurs and dilettantes, right? It was using those restrictions um, to do that. So as science increasingly became the province of professional communities, not only did individual scientists become more and more strongly incentivized uh, to restrict their attention to orthodox th theoretical proposals and questions of interest to the widest range of their colleagues, right? Very, very unlike gentlemen scholars, but introducing such restrictions was itself part of the very process of establishing those professionalized communities in the first place. Okay, yet another profound transformation was in store for the scientific enterprise in the middle decades of the 20th century, however, uh, following the conclusion of World War II. Um, here's the short version of what happened. Um, the central contribu contributions made by radar there on the upper left and the uh, Manhattan Project, the atom atomic bomb, uh, the, uh, the contributions that those science-based um, uh, uh, knowledge, the, the contributions of that science, scientific knowledge uh, generated uh, well, the, the things, the contributions of scientific knowledge that led to allied victory, right, uh, generated a wave of enthusiasm, especially in the United States, for financial support of scientific inquiry by the, by the state in, or, in an effort to increase military power, economic competitiveness, and other forms of strategic advantage. That is when, that's after World War II, is when the state got into the science business in a really big way. Institutions like the NSF were founded during this period with the intention to foster, in the famous words of Vannevar Bush, uh, the free play of free intellects, working on subjects of their own choice, in the manner dictated by their curiosity for the exploration of the unknown. Okay? Um, Bush was arguing here for scientific control rather than political control over the research priorities that, that uh, institutions like the NSF would, would pursue. Um, this, this is part of a, his case that successfully founded the NSF. And this was the picture, he, the, the picture of it that he was arguing for and he, and he uh, essentially won that argument. But since these, uh, uh, <clears throat> these swelling words, uh, the demand for accountability and oversight in the distribution of public funds have driven this process in what writers on science policy widely regard as a more conservative direction. Uh, Daryl Tubin and Edward Hackett put it this way, uh, perhaps times have changed or perhaps free intellects were never so freely at play in well-funded lab laboratories. However that may be, today's free intellects do not play freely, but instead find themselves tethered to national goals for health, defense, economic competitiveness and the like. Colleges, universities, and research institutes have come to depend on federal research support, a dependence that is transmitted and perhaps amplified along the way to the scientists and scholars they employ, further limiting intellectual free play. New ideas must pass through the filter of peer review, which stimulates opposition and encourages applicants to be cautious, if not conservative, in their proposal. What's he got in mind? Well, after all, a, a, a researcher who hopes to have her NSF or NIH grant proposal funded had better be proposing something new right, to get that funding, but she also had better not stray too far from conventional wisdom in her field about what are promising approaches, reasonable theoretical assumptions, and tractable questions. Even the prospect of such review, knowing that you're going to be reviewed uh, by a panel of, of your expert peers, um, uh, to, and they're trying to uh, invest your own effort most effectively 
um, that uh, seems sufficient to generate far more conservative grant proposals as authors of such proposals anticipate the likely review, the, the likely responses of review boards or committees, and then simply seek to invest their own time and energy as efficiently as possible. As the <clears throat> physicist Richard Muller wrote in Science, this is all the way back to 1980, uh, in US funding agencies, there appears to be little reward for initiative. It is safer to turn down requests or to delay them by submitting them to superiors for approval than to take a chance. Taking a risk by funding an innovative pro project can lead to trouble. And there are many projects that are risk-free and whose support can easily be defended. Referees frequently expect all potential problems to be identified and their solutions outlined. Unfortunately, and this is a striking claim. It is not an exaggeration to say that the, sorry, it's the striking claim was, was me, not Muller. Unfortunately, it's not an exaggeration to say that the agencies expect a proposal to outline the anticipated discoveries. That last remark seems almost incredible taken on its own, but it's nonetheless a familiar feature of the scientific landscape for those who regularly submit research proposals to the NSF and similar institutions. All right, before we get too far out of hand, we should remember that our old friend Kuhn himself famously argued long ago that most science is what he called normal science, seeking to make incremental progress along the lines suggested by contemporary theoretical orthodoxy. That's always a lot of what we do. But here's the, here's the change. The contemporary apparatus of peer-reviewed grant proposals and competitive funding for research in academic science by a small number of centralized agencies of the state, that arrangement has made it the case for the first time in history that peer judgments of plausibility and promise now determine not just the professional standing and status and remuneration of scientists who've actually achieved particular results or or <clears throat> uh, developed particular theoretical proposals, but also the lines of research and theoretical development that will be supported and therefore even can be pursued in the first place. That's the thing that's really new, um, is a situation where in order to even pursue your idea, because the vast majority of, of scientific work is now supported by these centralized um, agencies of the state. It used to be just sort of super special or super um, publicly beneficial science or something like that, but that's not how it works anymore, right? The uh, vast majority of science is supported by these uh, centralized granting agencies of the state. Uh, and so, right, we're now in a position where it's not just that, uh, you know, you, uh, if you, you have to decide to go do it on your own, but if you do something amazing, you're your peers are gonna uh, be super impressed. Now we've got panels of experts who are deciding which things we can even try out, right? Which things will even be supported for that exploratory line of experiments that's going to establish, try to establish them um, or to, to try to develop those kinds of uh, uh, radically novel proposal in the first place, okay? That's the new, that's the new, the thing that's new with the establishment of NSF and, and other granting agencies of the state. Uh, so, right, this is what uh, uh, Kuhn describes uh, as, you know, this, this is going on all the time, this gatekeeping and uh, complicated uh, uh, feedback, right? This is what the, what the NSF uh, uh, system has sort of evolved into, right? And we might think of, uh, of Kuhn's famous description of normal science as really being a description of grant-driven inquiry in physics after World War II. And, uh, if, and that uh, the, the broader view is that over the course of the historical um, the evolution of science, we've come to pursue uh, more normal and more normal uh, science all the way, uh, all the way along to the point that we now are pursuing extremely normal science uh, in preference to what Kuhn called revolutionary science. Um, now, oh, I had quotes here that I didn't. 
didn't do the slides. Uh, so, um, sorry, I'm gonna, I'm gonna have quotes for you that don't, sorry, I'm trying a new presentation setup. Let me, if it's just a, oh, I see that slide's just in the wrong, wrong spot. Um, uh, okay, so uh, yeah, I'm gonna have to give you some quotes that I don't have to put in front of your eyes. I'm sorry about that. Um, but let's talking about this new um, uh, this new system of research where the the support and the possibility of conducting that research in the first place all runs through the NSF or similar granting uh, uh, granting agencies. Uh, Luis Alvarez, the physicist, once described that peer review system as the greatest disaster visited on the com scientific community in this century, the 20th meeting, the 20th century, uh, noting that, quote, no group of peers would have approved my building the 72 inch bubble chamber, his big achievement, uh, right? And we have a little bit of experimental evidence that seems to support that kind of skepticism. So uh, uh, an early study by Mahoney found that referees rated a fictitious manuscripts methodology, data presentation, and overall scientific contribution as significantly higher, and they were more likely to re recommend publication when the results agreed with, rather than contradicted, the referee's presumed theoretical perspective. Much more recently, Resch, Ernst, and Garrow found that reviewers rated fictitious studies supporting unorthodox therapies less favorably than those supporting more conventional treatments, even when given equally strong supporting evidence. And people are natively biased against uh, heterodoxy. Uh, and so that's the sort of thing that might uh, lead us to think, uh, uh, oh, there really is a new, uh, a new set of institutions in place where there is a new way of doing science. Things changed at the end of, of World War II. Um, moreover, right, going back to, to to Kuhn, uh, Kuhn also famously suggested that the most crucial ingredient by far in the possibility of fundamental or revolutionary change in our scientific beliefs was the intellectual flexibility and freedom of younger scholars and those new to a given scientific field, right? That he thought that those are where the radical new ideas often come from. And that very flexibility and freedom would appear to be profoundly threatened by the combination of this system of peer reviewed grant proposals with the third and probably most familiar of the major historical developments I mentioned earlier, that is the emergence and accelerating expansion of what historian Derek DeSola Price memorably dubbed big science. And that is to say the emergence and accelerating expansion, right? the increasing amalgamation of scientific activity into ever larger and more complex research projects involving the increasingly widely distributed efforts of ever larger groups of scientists and institutions, right? Science is, is, is being done by uh, ever larger and larger um, uh, combinations of scientists and uh, specialists. Uh, the ongoing expansion of such big science has established and entrenched a much stricter kind of hierarchical organization in the pursuit of both scientific work and scientific careers. So these days, younger scholars and others new to a scientific field must typically spend uh, many years working as graduate students and postdocs under the supervision and advancing the research, existing research programs of more established researchers before starting research programs of their own. So contemporary grant-driven inquiry in most scientific fields is characterized by an increasingly stratified or hierarchical social structure in which the, uh, uh, the senior scientist in charge of a given lab or a given research group retains primary responsibility for bringing in the grants that keep the lab afloat financially. Um, these days that, that senior scientist is, uh, is often just referred to as the PI of the lab, it's a standard abbreviation as most of you probably know, for the principal investigator on an extra, extramural grant proposal, right? PIs is what, what senior scientists are, no, are known as now 
And make no mistake, getting grants is what PIs do, right? Well, at the same time, a variety of more junior scientists, including postdocs and students at various levels working under her direction and in collaboration with her, conduct most of the details of the research for which the lab or group is known. So that hierarchical arrangement multiplies opportunities for good things, for contact and training and mentorship between more senior and more junior scientists, that's part of why we have it, right? That surely improve the quality of the resulting scientific work in a wide variety of ways. But it just as surely serves to limit, to radically limit the extent to which younger or newer scholars are free to strike out on their own to explore new or unorthodox ideas that challenge existing theoretical conceptions of nature. So, uh, a recent exam, do I have this? I think I do, yeah. A recent examination of the proportions of primary research grants awarded to younger and newer researchers by the NIH offers some striking empirical confirmation for that, for the claim I just made, right? So this is what the figure one is about here, right? And it's what it's showing is that the, the median age at which a PhD researcher uh, first, we actually don't, don't worry about the, just, just the graph for now, um, right? What that graph shows is that the median age at which a PhD researcher first becomes a principal investigator on her own NIH grant has risen steadily from age 36 in 1980. That's the, the, the median age at which a new uh, investigator would get her own, have her own um, uh, NIH grant. Uh, it, it's risen steadily from age 36 in 1980 to age 42 in 2002. That's a lot of movement in a relatively short period, period of time uh, um, on an historical timescale. Uh, in addition, the authors of that of this uh, paper note, the number and percentage of grants awarded to younger researchers has been decreasing. While investigators under the age of 40 received over half the competitive award research awards in 1980, that age cohort received fewer than 17% of awards in 2003. Moreover, the percentage and absolute number of rewards, awards made to new investigators, regardless of age, has declined over the last several years, with new investigators receiving less than 4% of NIH research awards made in 2002. Uh, perhaps all this makes it less surprising that the foundation for NIH's uh, Lurie Prize intended for a promising young scientist in biomedical research, right? The, the qualifications for being nominated for that prize uh, uh, re require that the nominees must be no older than 52, right? That's what the, the upper age limit is now for a promising young scientist in biomedical research, all right? So, um, Look, it's important to say, senior scientists are not, of course, they're, they're, they're not trying. Their goal is not to prevent more junior researchers from pursuing unorthodox or iconoclastic ideas. Instead, they're simply teaching them how to conduct research and pursue careers most effectively in the existing environment. Uh, indeed, as uh, mentors and advisors to aspiring young professional scientists, it would be arguably irresponsible of them to, for them to do anything else. Uh, graduate education in the sciences now typically includes uh, explicit instruction, often entire courses dedicated to teaching graduate students how to write proposals right, that are maximally likely to be accepted at review panels by review panels at institutions like the NSF and the NIH. Right? This is a big part of graduate education now. <clears throat> Even the somewhat more advanced scholars who are still working towards securing permanent academic employment uh, simply can't afford to risk investing significant amounts of time in ambitious or revolutionary proposals without near guarantees of predictable results in the short term. So learning science today involves finding, proposing, and conducting research projects in collaboration with one's advisor or mentor with the very best chances of being approved and funded by groups of established researchers in the field. And that's new. Um, so in fact, the increasingly hierarchical organization of scientific careers actually constrains independence and creativity in both directions. For her own part, 
right? A senior, a, a, a PI, right? To decide to pursue a genuinely novel or transformative research program, more likely to provoke skepticism from a granting agencies, program managers, or review committees. In order to do that, a, PA, a, a PI must now be willing to risk not only her own scientific fortunes, but also those of the small army of less well-situated scientific workers whose careers depend upon her own. Ironically, these younger and less senior scientists that the PI seeks to protect, who might otherwise pursue riskier or more iconoclastic projects, have an ever-diminishing say in the direction of the lab's research as well as their own. All right, all of this might simply seem to confirm dire prophecies made by an earlier generation of scientists about this NSF peer, centralized peer reviewed uh, um, system for distributing uh, uh, support for scientific uh, work. Uh, so uh, here, sorry, here is where we've got Alvarez saying nobody would have approved of him uh, building the bubble cham chamber and here on the bottom is just, that's just, those are just the, the uh, experiments I told you about earlier um, that seem to, seem to bear out um, the effective biases, uh, uh, reviewer biases in what things that they approve or, or rate highly. Um, but the, the, uh, the beat of these, of these uh, dire predictions goes on, right? Um, uh, it was uh, Nor Norbert Wiener once called this the, latter-day feudal system of the intellect in which a size Norbert, right? In which a younger scientist would simply be a cog in a modern scientific factory doing what I was told, accepting the problems given me by my superiors and holding my, only bra my own brain only in commendum as a medieval vassal held his field. He adds that from the bottom of my heart, I pity the present generation of scientists, many of whom, whether they wish it or not, are doomed by the spirit of the age to be intellectual lackeys and clock punchers. Uh, elf, elsewhere, Wiener offers an impassioned lament for the degradation of the scientist as an independent worker and thinker to that of morally irresponsible stooge in a science factory. Um, so those are amusingly over the top in the way that, uh, that Norbert Wiener often is, um, but they reflect a real concern uh, about uh, um, a, a real change in the, uh, the way that science is done. M maybe more revealing than, than uh, Norbert Wiener's uh, uh, bombast uh, is Albert Einstein's report on his own behalf to an American journalist in 1954. He says, if I were a young man again and had to decide how to make a living, I would not try to become a scientist or scholar or teacher. I would rather choose to be a plumber or peddler in hope of finding that modest degree of independence still available under present circumstances. Now the ongoing expansion of big science in the decades since Einstein first made this striking remark, right? This was in 1954, uh, very soon after the centralized peer review system was being, had been put in place, right? And the ongoing decades since then uh, have, simply accelerated the evaporation of such intellectual independence. And especially dramatic illustration of this evaporation can I think be found in the system of academic authorship that was adopted in 1998 by the Collider Detector Fermilab or CDF as it's sometimes called. Uh, all scientists and engineers, everybody who works at the CDF, after one year of working there, they're added to something called the standard authors list and they are removed from that list one year after they leave the institution, okay? What's the standard authors list for? Well, any publication coming out of the CDF at any given time is simply authored by the entire current listing of standard authors who work at the institution listed in alphabetical order and running at present between 400 and 500 members, right? So this, this takes us up to the Fs here, This uh, um, this sample uh, uh, paper, right? That's the title of paper and this is the authors. It's just everybody who, who um, all the scientists and engineers who work at CD, CDF. Uh, now that arrangement surely rewards cooperation and teamwork, 
and it duly recognizes the contributions of all of those involved in a given piece of scientific research, but it seems hard to imagine a system of incentives better designed to favor theoretically conservative and incremental scientific contributions over theoretical iconoclasm, individual creativity, and intellectual independence. Now, it may surprise you uh, to learn that some of the most forceful critics of conservatism in the contemporary apparatus of peer-reviewed grant proposals for specific projects, right? Some of those who most strongly argue that this process is inherently and excessively conservative are the very administrators who oversee that apparatus at institutions like the NSF and the NIH, right? So I'm gonna run real quickly through just a few of these to give you the, the idea. Uh, um, uh, NSF program, uh, program director, so this is uh, on a, uh, an examination of this very issue, are constrained to support conservative proposals and projects which are sure bets and that they're most likely to provide some definable product in a short period of time. They're under pressure not to take longer shots on more imaginative or longer term projects. So that was an aid to Garfield Stever when Stever was running the NSF, reporting to, um, reporting the, uh, the way things look to him. Um, uh, this is Richard Kington, the acting director of the NIH as of 2009, or uh, in 2009. This is, we have a system that works overall pretty uh, well and is very good at ruling out bad things. We don't fund bad research, but given that, we also recognize that the system probably provides disincentives to funding really transformative uh, research. Uh, likewise, scientists don't like, like talking about it publicly, but there's no conversation that I've had about the grant system that doesn't have an incredible sense of consensus that it is not working. That is a terrible wasted opportunity for the scientists, patients, the nation, and the world. Although important discoveries have been achieved in research that was funded by the NIH, this is, this is pretty striking, I actually believe that by and large it is despite rather than because of the review system. That's Richard Klausner, who was the director of the National Cancer Institute in 2009. And so I, it's interesting to me, and in some ways, especially revealing that um, the folks who run and administer these grant, these centralized grant agencies see uh, fostering conservatism and not managing to fo foster radically new ideas as a, as a serious problem. Um, the result of their concerns, right, their collective concern, has been a renewed focus in recent years at the NSF and many other granting agencies on seeking to foster what they call transformative research, okay? Um, which the NSF describes as devoted to revolutionizing entire disciplines, creating entirely new fields or disrupting accepted theories and perspectives. Uh, so this is a or the new watchword uh, at the NSF we're trying to get transformative research, which means that. Uh, but unfortunately, the NSF presently pursues this goal simply by exhorting reviewers and program managers to support such research, right? So you wanna know how to do transformative research, how to think outside the box, how to blow everybody's mind, we've got a website for that. The NSF will tell you how to do transformative, we'll give you a recipe for doing uh, transformative research, uh, right? And so there's something troubling uh, about the fact that, right, the NSF is using its, uh, the, the existing institutions to try to get to this uh, transformative research, right? So they, they tell program managers and reviewers to support transformative research. And they require that both authors and reviewers of research proposal comment explicitly on the potentially transformative character of those proposals. Um, but there's no real reason to expect scientists to be any better than the rest of us at setting aside, setting aside deep rooted biases when they gather to evaluate a set of specific proposals and decide which ones are simply the best of that group. And that form of collective decision-making still characterizes virtually everything that the NSF does. Uh, even the NSF Career Awards, intended to support exceptionally promising young researchers, are awarded on the basis of a peer-reviewed competitive proposal for a specific program of research. And the same is true for similar programs that try to encourage theoretical 
uh, diversity and heterodoxy, like the NIH's Pioneer Program, the ERC's Synergy Grants, and the NSF's Creative Program. I want to suggest that I think it would be more effective to instead diversify the methods that we use to distribute uh, uh, resources for scientific inquiry. And that might ultimately involve uh, the invention of whole new forms of evaluation and dist distribution. But in the meantime, we already have the models by which such resources were distributed in earlier historical era, uh, eras, uh, nor are those alternatives entirely unknown in our own day. Rather like aristocratic patronage, uh, the MacArthur Foundation's so-called genius grants and the Howard Hughes Medical Institute's uh, grants famously support exceptionally creative and successful scientists rather than particular to do whatever they want to do rather than particular projects. Uh, similarly, scientific prizes like the famous Longitude Prize are now offered for particular technological accomplishments by corporations like Netflix and the XPRIZE Foundation. So diversification would be a matter of expanding the proportion of scientific research, especially publicly funded scientific research, which is currently distributed exclusively on this um, peer-reviewed grant model, right? Having more of the publicly funded scientific research supported in these other ways as well as any promising novel ways that we can devise. Um, now, I don't mean to suggest, yes, let's that back up. Uh, I don't wanna suggest that we simply give up peer reviewed project proposals in favor of one of these other alternatives. Every single way of distributing the available resources for scientific inquiry is gonna have its own advantages and drawbacks. Okay. The idea is instead to diversify our portfolio, so to speak, distributing at least some of those resources in ways that are less likely to foster an entrenched theoretical conservatism than peer-reviewed grant proposals for specific projects do. But we have to recognize, right? it would be dishonest not to recognize, that any such changes, moving any amount out of peer-reviewed uh, proposals, uh, would uh, will also incur costs. If we fund more risky and iconoclastic science that contemporary experts regard as unpromising, we will almost certainly wind up funding more science that goes nowhere and achieves nothing as well, right? And such costs remind us that even if we believe there are things we could do to pursue contemporary scientific inquiry in a less theoretically conservative way, we still have to ask whether we should do them. And the answer to that question depends maybe surprisingly, on the question with which we began. Whether contemporary scientific theories give us, as the scientific realist thinks, roughly accurate descriptions of how things stand in otherwise inaccessible parts of nature, or are instead, as uh, an historicist critic like Kuhn thinks, or like I think, right, are instead simply the latest in an ongoing succession of fundamentally different theories, each more empirically successful and powerful than its predecessors. Now, perhaps surprisingly, I suggest that our old friend, the scientific realist can afford to be cavalier or even enthusiastic about evidence of increasing theoretical conservatism in science. After all, right, uh, she thinks that contemporary theories have things sorted out at least roughly right and our remaining er errors are simply errors of detail. So she's confident that the theories embraced by future scientific communities will seem both to us and to the members of those communities simply to be corrected, expanded, and more sophisticated versions of the ones that we ourselves have accepted. As long as review panels police only the most broadly accepted points of theoretical orthodoxy in their funding decisions, the realists should be perfectly happy to rule out consideration of lines of research or theoretical proposals that are radically or fundamentally at odds with existing theories because she thinks it's quite unlikely that any such alternative will ultimately come to be accepted in the future. Indeed, the farther from existing theoretical orthodoxy of proposed research project strays, the more confident the realist will be that it's misguided in some fundamental way. Of course, we might learn something important and useful from research willing to call fundamental theoretical claims or principles into question, right? The, even though the realist might think we would get something valuable, um, 
uh, out of that. But there's absolutely no reason to think that we will learn anything more important or useful than we would by using the same funds to support a different line of research, adhering more closely to the theoretical orthodoxy that the realist assures us is at least approximately true. In fact, the scientific realist might well celebrate any evidence of increasing theoretical conservatism in our distribution of what are, after all, scarce public resources for scientific inquiry. We want to use them as efficiently as possible. By contrast, the historicist critic of scientific realism, somebody like Kuhn or like me, sees the future of science as one in which further fundamental theoretical revolutions are still to come. Revolutions as profound as that which separated Einstein's physics from Newton's, Newton's from Descartes, and Descartes from Aristotle's. She doubts that even the best presently available conceptual tools she has for thinking about nature will retain that status indefinitely as future inquiry proceeds. And she shudders to think of all the transformative research throughout the history of science that would never have been conducted in an environment in which the serious pursuit of scientific research required convincing a panel of peers broadly steeped in current theoretical orthodoxy that it was likely to bear worthwhile fruit. Accordingly, any, whatever reasons the realist might have for wanting to invest in things like revolutionizing entire disciplines, creating entirely new fields, or disrupting accepted theories and perspectives, the historicist critic of realism has all those reasons too, but also another that is far more important. She thinks that even more successful theories, fundamentally distinct from contemporary theoretical orthodoxy, as distinct from contemporary theoretical, theoretical orthodoxy as uh, Einstein's mechanics is from Newton's and Newton's was from Descartes and Descartes was from Aristotle. Right? She thinks that even more successful theories are still out there. Okay? So for the historicist critic of scientific realism, she thinks that one of the most important ambitions of the scientific enterprise should be identifying and developing the fundamentally distinct and even more powerful successors that will ultimately come to replace even the most impressive theories of the present day, provided we continue to look for them. Um, let me close just with, um, by, by, with, a, with a quick question, uh, and I will be indicating why I'm, uh, one of the reasons I'm especially interested in hearing from this audience about this stuff. Um, it's not clear to me um, that nurses or a nurse, an institution uh, dedicated to nursing um, would, would or wouldn't be especially concerned about the problem I'm describing, if it is a problem, of increasing theoretical conservatism in the kind of scientific inquiry that we, uh, uh, that we pursue. Uh, because many of the kinds of studies that um, uh, that would be the sort, sort of research that go on in, uh, in fields like nursing are highly applied, of course, right? We're worried about whether this method or that method is a, 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 you know, has better outcomes for patients. Um, we're, and so, you know, in uh, research proposals for nursing, it seems to me we might not often be uh, in a situation where um, we're talking about radical new uh, uh, theories that are that represent some part of nature in a radically different way, um, but that's that is just an intuitive uh, an intuitive reaction, and so I'm I'm very much interested in hearing more from people about um, the extent to which or the ways in which a concern like this or an argument like this uh, about uh, increasing theoretical conservatism in science and what what we're, there is to do about it uh, uh, really hits home uh, for, um, for a, a, a field that is in many ways uh, quite different from the scientific fields that I'm usually thinking about like fundamental physics um, and, uh, and, and other uh, fundamental theory of some otherwise inaccessible part of nature. Um, so, uh, so anyway, I'll, I'll close with that and thank you for your time. And I'm uh, very enthusiastic about hearing your questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kyle. I am going to um, bring myself back into the game and I'm going to have, ask you if you would perhaps stop sharing your screen so that you become more sure. visible. Sure thing.
Uh, I have to figure out where I am. Oh, there I am. <laughs> okay. Right. So thank you for that um, fantastic talk. Had to do some logistics there really quick. Uh, there's uh, a lot going on in the chat box. I don't see um, a very specific question put into the Q&A box. Um, I highly recommend um, um, the current attendees if they would like a very specific question um, asked to Kyle that you put it in the Q&A box rather than the chat box. And I had... I did want to, uh, to 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 start this off. You you mentioned does 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 nursing have this problem in uh, yeah in funding? Uh, um, Dr. Gortner was our first director of what is now called the National Institute of Nursing Research within the Nas National Institutes of Health, mm -hmm. uh, and she in a 1975 paper does uh, I, I think a really good job describing this the the perspective of nursing within the National Institute of Health, where she writes of a person, a director from another, uh, another National Institute uh, of Health. I, I, I don't see which one it is, you know, mental health or, or this or that. Uh, but quote, he then went on to describe what he thought nursing research was, what more beyond the examination of techniques, such as how to make an impeccable looking bed. So not only are we dealing with conservatism in the peer review process, we're dealing with conservatism in terms of what we even think are phenomenon worth getting some theoretical traction on. A very sensible point. And if nobody has a question right now, maybe I get to start and use my prerogative as the as, as the moderator here to ask you something. So mm -hmm. I'm, I have a couple of, I have a couple of questions or points, maybe some that go a little bit um, deeper than, um, than the idea of peer review and is, and, and how does that potentially, you know, bake puzzle solving and, and reproducing the paradigm back into, um, yeah, as, as reality. I'm wondering about this whole idea of unconceived alternatives, um, because for whatever reason, when I'm thinking about it, the idea of the organization of scientific work, of course, becomes relevant, as you've just mentioned. But I'm wondering a little bit about the direction of the argument, which seems to presuppose that the idea or the person or team having the idea is what's to be championed. Like you mentioned, you mentioned before that there were the gentlemen uh, gen gentlemen, male privileged scientists, and then we get we 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 now have career scientists, which of which I guess I'm supposed to consider myself one of them. So the status of the idea becomes then the one that might be better. And then my question is: Is better at what? Better at filling epistemic virtues? Um, is it better at policy? You know, um, um, configuring. Um, you know, po policy ideas that, you know, that we, we want to cure cancer. So, you know, so if your idea can help us cure cancer, you're in. Um, mm -hmm. So what, yeah, what, what, what's better? This is also uh, relevant to the uh, remark uh, somebody uh, put on the uh, chat uh, about whether it's really appropriate to talk about truth in this case anyway, right? As also kind of a specification of what do you, right? If we're, if, Something's supposed to make it better. What's supposed to be better about it? And so I, uh, I the argument is framed in terms of I think uh, what are thought of as uh, uh, pretty straightforward um, indicators of uh, uh, yeah. Uh, pretty straightforward criteria, at a minimum, is applied to pretty straightforward criteria, simply like success in prediction uh, and explanation, right? That's the kind of ground on which the scientific community, community ultimately decided, oh, Einstein's relativistic physics is just better. Is it just a better theory uh, than Newtonian mechanics was? Because it en enables us to make 
uh, more accurate predictions about what's going to happen, and it enables us to explain things that we couldn't explain um, using Newtonian mechanics. So I have tried to frame the argument in terms of virtues of theories that I think should be pretty uncontentious and uh, not loaded. Uh, and in, with respect to the truth business, I'm very happy to frame this in terms of um, theories not being better uh, that that needn't mean, and for the historicist critic of realism, Kuhn or me, it better not mean closer to the actual truth about what the underlying domain looks like, right? The picture of, of, of somebody like Kuhn who thinks we're going to keep having scientific revolutions is that we're going to be giving up um, a useful conceptual instrument for a more useful conceptual instrument, but that's still conceived of in terms of what does it let us predict, what does it let us explain. Um, so it's certain there are certainly there's a lot of room to ask and um, and wonder about other ways in which a theory might be better than another theory, right? You you mentioned better for policy, so that's like uh, in a way a, a different kind of virtue you might think of. Um, but but there's there's uh, there's every reason it, it's perfectly reasonable to have um, uh, to to raise the same worry about um, whatever sort of better you've got in mind. Um, the the uh, uh, idea is whether we're is really whether we're in, investing in in trying to find radically new things. We're investing in trying to make incremental improvements on the existing thing that we have. And you don't have to think about better in terms of proximity to the truth, right? You can think about it in terms of improved practical utility, right? Um, in, improved pragmatic uh, power. As, and, and so that's, those, that's the kind of better we've got in mind when we say, um, look, uh, Einstein's mechanics is better than Newton's mechanics and uh, was ultimately judged by the relevant scientific community to be um, to be better. Uh, and it's a, a matter of hooking up what we want with how we design scientific institutions, right? If we want to get a certain kind of thing out of the theories that are great for policy or whatever, right? Then we need to build a system of incentives and institutional support um, that encourages encourages that, right? And so right now I've got everything set up in terms of, of the argument is supposed to run uh, uh, in, in terms of theories being better for traditional kinds of, of goals like prediction and intervention and explanation. Um, but it seems to me you could raise the same concern about, look, are we really incentivizing the kind of thing that we want to get out of this um, process uh, um, you, you could raise, raise the same question about that for almost any sense of whatever whatever you think makes one theory better than another. Are we still are we investing in science in such a way as to keep getting theories that are better by that standard, whatever it is? This is also though why I emphasize the thing about costs, right? It's very easy, and it would be very easy to wrap up a discussion like this just with a celebration of creativity and, and intellectual diversity and heterodoxy and striking things down and intellectual creativity in science is very important. And, uh, but, it, but that would also be a little bit dishonest, I think, right? But what we really want is to be, have the, the, our institutions designed, set up and functioning in such a way that they produce what we really want uh, or have the best chances of producing what we want uh, uh, out of scientific and green research. And if we don't think that there are even better theories out there waiting to, um, to be discovered, then it's not as important. It's not a fabulous idea to shovel more of our scarce public funds to people who are trying to break the barriers and, and challenge, right? That's only a good idea if, if we think that those uh, you know, successful alternative approaches uh, are are really out there, and um, and then that we're in in a position to to go find them if we keep looking for them, right? And so that's why the costs matter. It, it um, no, nothing's cost free. It's a matter of investing what we, the what we have for for the support of science in one way rather than a different way. 
trying to set it up in such a way that you're most likely to get what you want out of it. So I have, a, I have a lot to respond to that, but I'm not going to because we've got lots and lots of questions. But thank you for that. That's amazing. I was uh, so, waiting for those to arrive. Yes. And so we have um, Rusla, hello. Um, and she or, or he mentions what you've presented today is, is a reality across academic disciplines. And her question is, how do new scholars resist this reality of theoretical conservatism? Um, well, it is hard to... Uh, uh, it's hard to resist a little bit of, uh, of saying how bad the problem is. Again. I think, I mean, I think it's very hard for young uh, researchers to resist this because uh, it's, it's, the biggest reason is this thing I was saying about how academic careers are structured, right? I mean, in the, it's in the interest of helping the person, the aspiring scientist that um, we, uh, uh, that the you know, senior scientist is saying, well, here's a good idea. And why don't you work on this little part of my research program first? And then you will, right, we're going to build it up so that you can write your own NS, NSF proposals and all that. That's obviously exactly the right thing you wanted to do to try to help somebody most successfully um, pursue a career in academic science. And so um, the, uh, and so we're asking a lot. The, so to not, quite answer the not a, not answer the, the actual question that was asked we're asking an awful lot of young scientists if we really think that young scientists uh, uh, new scientists and uh, young scientists and those new to a field are where a lot of these theoretically heterodox ideas are going to come from if we if we think that we're asking an awful lot of them to sort of stand up and say, well, no person who's in charge of my life and whose research I came here to help with, I think that's a dumb idea. And I think nature works very differently. And I'm going to going to start pursuing that, right? Um, it's a, it would be incredibly hard for a young person um, to, uh, you know, uh, um, stand astride that <laughs> uh, uh, that track and say stop. And so I think that's part of why, I mean, maybe maybe the best answer to, uh, to the question is, um, I think this isn't a matter of what we ask or give new researchers if, if we wanna make things less theoretically conservative. It's gonna to have to be a way of how we design, how we redesign um, the incentive structure of science itself. It's not something we can ask people to do as individuals. I don't think there's a good good strategy for, you know, I mean, we can send out a lot of leaflets encouraging people to stand up for their own bold ideas against their, uh, uh, but that's not going to do it, right? What people do what they're incentivized to do. And, uh, and we're set up in a, a system now where that is what they're incentivized to do. Um, so I think what we need to do is, um, right, part of the idea of loosening up or diversifying those ways that we um, give support to scientific research is making it more po is making it possible for the institution to uh, of scientific inquiry to support more of that iconoclastic research, um, even without telling young researchers, oh no, you right, science is going to die if you don't uh, if you don't do what's dangerous for your career. Speaks to a lot about new structures and processes for science, definitely. Yeah, which are always changing, but um, part of the part of what's nice about a, an historical perspective is you can see the big what big changes really mattered, right? Really, sort of had a had a big impact when you're thinking about okay, what do we want to do right now? And it also speaks to the idea that it's not just ideas that drive science. Highly right. So we have another question from Roger. Hi, Roger. Nice to nice to see you here again. Um, his question is: Is why do realists think that they have covered the ground and not and not covered the ground so far? I'm. So the question is: Is why do realists think they have covered the ground and and not covered the ground so far? I'm so I'm going to answer what I think the question is about, but Roger should feel free to write in if I'm not getting it. Um, what I suspect that question is about, uh, let me try to answer something more, a little more general. What do realists say about all of this, right? How, how does a realist respond to the, um, the picture I just presented, right? And 
Um, the answer to that is that the realist is a sort of, He, he's he's added some context. He said it was your slide realist versus historicist. Right. Uh, so, right. So the re, the real, oh, oh, covered the ground in that sense. Okay, right. So um, there's a couple things for the realist to say there. One is, uh, look, okay, there's this history, right? Where we've, we've encountered things and, and sometimes given them up in radical transformative ways in the past, okay? But the realist, so the realist is something of an, of an exceptionalist about the present, right? He thinks, look, at some point, um, uh, you know, in chemistry, uh, in, in uh, physics, in biology, at some point uh, we reached a kind of threshold where our, our theories are so successful in these traditional, the traditional ways I was mentioning before, um, that that really they couldn't be that successful without being true. And so, uh, the scientific realist thinks we've at least we, that at least in in partic particular cases they can point to and be confident about probably physics, chemistry, and to some extent biology. Um, the realist is going to point, point and say, look, we covered enough of the ground to find the right thing, to find the true thing. Uh, and so they're, they think that they have sufficiently strong evidence that relativistic mechanics is true, right? that that's just the way the world is, for example, um, that we don't need to worry about the unconceived alternatives, right? Alternative theories that might, um, uh, that might be even better because we have really good reason to believe that we have um, uh, that we're in in possession of the of the truth already about that um, that inaccessible domain of nature or uh, or, or or a different one. Um, and so, part of the thing to say about that, right? So, um, there's almost a perspective uh, trick here. If you just stay focused in on a particular scientific theory we have, let's say quantum mechanics or dark matter, right? Uh, and we say, we just focus on that and we ask, you know, okay, well, if I believe this is more or less the right story about uh, nature, uh, what can I, uh, you know, what, what would it let me do? Oh, here are the predictions I would make, here are things I could explain and, and, uh, and all of that. And so, the, the, this is where the realist's intuition is strong. You say, well, gosh, how could it be, have all that success? How could we do all those things? I mean, we make drugs that save people's lives and fly to Paris and stuff, right? How, to the moon. How can we, can we do all that stuff with a theory that isn't even roughly right, isn't fundamentally right about what that part of, how that part of nature works? And that seems extremely convincing. If you dial back out and look at the history of science, it seems much less convincing in part because, and this is in a way the thing I think people don't viscerally appreciate, um, the past, past theory, scientific theories that were overturned were themselves often extremely successful, right? Um, there's, there is no better example than Newtonian mechanics itself, which we still use as an engineering approximation um, because it's so handy and makes predictions so close to uh, those of relativity at times and scales that we actually care about and operate on, right? Um, there, was, there was no better theory in, in, than Newtonian mechanics. There was no more successful theory. People wrote poems to praising hymns, praising Newton as having read the mind of God because it was, physics was supposed to be over, right? And so I think, and, and it's true that relativity is even more empirically successful than Newtonian mechanics was, but that pattern, that historical pattern, um, I think would make us very, should make us very leery of thinking that uh, empirical success of the kind that impresses us is a good reliable guide to 
to truth. What we seem to find in the context of fundamental theoretical science is that there's lots and lots of ways for a theory to uh, ground empirical success, uh, even if it, when it's not even a roughly accurate picture of the underlying natural domain, as we now think Newtonian mechanics is not even a roughly accurate picture of the underlying domain. Newtonian mechanics is a theory about masses and forces uh, and uh, relativity doesn't have any forces. There aren't any forces. There's no gravitational force. There's just massive objects moving in curved space time. So it's a completely different story about what the world is like, what the furniture of the world is made up of and how it interacts, right? But uh, Newtonian mechanics uh, and many, many, many of these other theories that were overturned, um, right, were, were also extremely successful. Uh, and so that's the, in a way that from the narrow, uh, with a narrow view, realism looks really, really appealing. And with an historical view, uh, realism looks much, much less appealing. Right. But, the, but to return to the question, that, that is what the realist thinks about covering the ground, right? They think we have independent, we have evidence now that we've done it well enough that we found the truth, at least in some fields, and those we shouldn't be chasing crazy uh, radical alternatives. So I was thinking the M word throughout your entire answer, but anyway, <laughs> metaphysics. So here is another question from Mickey Williams. Hi, Mickey, nice to see you. Okay, here's her question. Is, is fear a part of this constraint on revolutionary discovery? I'm wondering if our social structure is built upon what we choose to know, not know, rather than a deep understanding of what there is to know. Seem to see that in our social resistance to diversity in healthcare. Even we do not seem comfortable operating very distant from the center of the bell curve, so we do not choose to discover across the full continuum. So a fear of this maybe inherent constraint on revolutionary discovery of right. not being comfortable choosing to discover across the continuum. So this is a very big question, um, and there's there are lots of things to say about it. Um, one is, uh, I, uh, so it is true that I think fear uh, or discomfort with the unknown uh, is playing an important role here. It's one of the things that makes it hard for people to uh, take, <laughs> I'm using the questions for reference, but you take them away as when you, when you have decided to answer them. Oh, here, just <laughs> click an answer. That's okay. Go to the next box, sorry. <laughs> That's all right. Um, I was only concerned about it with this one because as I said, there are a number of different things to say. Um, but but I, can, I'll, I can remember, not, it's not a problem. Um, so, so one is, yeah, I think discomfort with the idea that we know much less than we think we know is a big part of why uh, why realism is popular to for people, right? It, it is it is definitely a scary proposition that oh we we thought we knew kind of you know what the fundamental structure of matter was and what the history the deep history of of geological time looks like and what the inside of the sun looks like and all that. And if we say no 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 we just have useful conceptual instruments that keep that and we keep getting better and better ones in each of these fields and we say oh Oh, I see. So we don't actually, or we shouldn't take this description as accurate of what the inside of the sun is like or, or uh, whatever. Um, and that is to um, give up a lot of the uh, knowledge that comforts and, and makes us feel secure in an otherwise uncertain and frightening world. Um, so I definitely think that, that uh, there, are choice, we're, there are choices being made here about what we want to know and don't want to know. And fear of um, not knowing uh, is something that drives, I think, the popularity of, uh, of realism. Now, um, with respect to, so, so that's all, the, the way I just described something like fear of the unknown being relevant here is, is sort of an echo of the more specific things that the questioner was talking about, right? If, uh, about sort of always wanting to operate <laughs> in the, uh, inside the bell curve and and not probe those outer reaches, but I don't think th that I'm not so sure about because um, 
after all the, I mean, look, a big part of, of Kuhn's case, for example, um, was that look, most scientific activity happens because scientists see something they can do, um, something that, that uh, some new item of knowledge or some new uh, thing that they can go apply an existing accepted theory to um, productively. And so it's only when problems come up for that and whatnot that, that we are even motivated to think about alternatives. Um, and so I think the, you know, the biggest reason, there's a, there's a strong, um, uh, there's a strong incentivizing and homogenizing influence of uh, uh, scientific activity that, you know, when the incentives are structured in the way that they are right now, say, that makes it significantly more theoretically conservative. But I don't think that fundamentally has to do with fear of the unknown or hating things out past the tales of the distribution or hating the weird and, and things that don't fit into our um, existing, uh, existing picture. My experience is that scientists love that stuff because it also is, uh, uh, it also uh, is uh, informative and it represents something, you know, it's the challenge that you then can go take your, uh, your best theory to, to, to try to solve. And so I don't think scientists, the, the things that are making scientists be theoretically conservative in their approach, I don't think that's because because of a psychological fact about them, like fear, like their fear of the things out past the tails of the distribution. Um, I think it's, and, and in a way this is what's frustrating about it, it's uh, the, the conservatism is instead a consequence of the ways that, that uh, scientific careers are now structured and incentivized. Um, that's what we, that is what, staying within the, uh, to, this is now up at the level of metaphor, but staying within the bell curve, right, is now what you have to do in order to get your grant funded, be able to do the research that you wanna do in the first place. And that I don't, there's no part of that, I think that's just driven by fear of the unknown or, or being hostile to thinking about things that don't fit what we've already got. I think scientists are very excited about doing that. It's that we're giving them less freedom and less incentive to really do that. Um, than we should be if what we want out of our science is the the next um, the next great theory and the next new yes yes power I, I was thinking about power and your answer as well while we do still have some more questions it's it's eleven twenty eight and I think we have to wrap up which is a shame because the questions are are wonderful we might be able to perhaps have answers written and provided, you know, in our, in our, in our wrap up website or something to that effect. Happy to. Okay, wonderful. Well, it's 1129. We have to end up. Thank you to everybody for um, attending the today's event. Thank you, Kyle, for being here and sharing with us. This has been um, really generative of discussion and conversation and many more questions and yeah, thoughts for what our future can be like in nursing science and science in general. So thank you and um, everybody have a wonderful rest of your day and uh, weekend. Bye everyone.